All right, so today we're starting on the second to last uh, module for this course, which is uh, algorithms and algorithm analysis. Uh, after that, it's trees and tree-based data structures. So uh, this will probably take us a week and a half or so, maybe up to two weeks, uh, depending on how much we want to do on this. Uh, but we will start looking at algorithms from a more abstract mathematical perspective. And to be able to do that, we need to formulate some sort of framework for looking at algorithms, defining algorithms, and then talking about them from a mathematical perspective. Uh, before we do that, though, let's go ahead and review uh, that, that uh, a similar demonstration to what we did uh, with respect to array lists and uh, linked lists. Uh, and I've got an experiment set up here for an index-based retrieval operation. Uh, so what I mean by that is what I've, I've got a random number generator. Uh, and then we'll start out with an array list here. And we'll fill it up with 1,000 random integers. Okay. Uh, and wh while we're doing that, uh, we don't care how long it takes us to do that. Uh, instead, we'll uh, you know, say done, and then uh, we'll start summing them up. That's what we're actually going to do here. All right, we're going to sum up all those random values. Uh, and I will start the timer before and the timer after, and then we'll report how much time it actually took to do that on an array base list. And if you do this for small numbers, obviously 1,000, you're not going to notice it that much. If you go up to 10,000, 10 times as big, it's still not going to be very noticeable. 0 0.001 seconds becomes the same, 0 0.001 seconds. It's only when you get up to, say, 100,000 that you start seeing a difference. Now it's twice as big, right? 10 times as big, 100, uh, what is that, a million? Yep, there's a million, right? But it's still, you know, almost imperceptible to us. Uh, if I go up to 10 million, right, then it starts, I mean, the load time there was noticeable, but it's still only 0 0.03 seconds here. Let's start over with a linked list. Now remember, I am using a uh, linked list. I am using Java's linked list and array-based list here because my own were uh, uh, not as efficient as they could have been. Uh, so now I'm using as, as efficient as it can be for a linked list here with a Java implementation. 1,000 is gonna be very, very similar to what we had before, 0 0.001. It's not noticeable at all. Right? Uh, let me go ahead and kick it up to say 10,000. Now it starts to become a little bit more noticeable. Right? It went from 0 0.001 to 0 0.055. It's like 50 times as slow, right? But small numbers, who cares? Maybe it's just a fluke. Let's go up to 100,000 here. It was uh, 0 0.05 seconds before. Almost 100 times as slow here. Almost five full seconds now. Now, I'm not going to run the experiment over and over and over again. Instead, I'm going to tell you that I've done it before already. Right? And here are the results. Now, on the x-axis here, these are in thousands. So this is 400,000, 600,000, 1,000 thousands. We call them millions. Right? So when, when we got up to a million here, this is, and now this is in, time, in terms of seconds over here. So we're almost at 600 here. We're between 500 and 600 at the end here. So we're talking about almost 10 minutes, nine minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, something like that for a million. I am not going to bother running that experiment here in class. I'll run it in the background so that you can see that, yeah, it's gonna take a while, all right. Okay. What I did is I did this for every 10,000 all the way up or whatever these, these blue ticks are here. Sometimes, you know, things were slower, higher than usual. Sometimes things were quicker, lower than usual. Those are just sample errors, empirical sample errors. What is this red line right here? That red line is a quadratic regression. Because from the, from the curve of this line, it looked like it was going up in a quadratic uh, perspective. It certainly wasn't linear. What would a linear line look like? Just a straight curve, right? Now, it could be steep. It could be shallow. What's the opposite of steep? Gentle? A gentle curve, right? It could be somewhere in the middle. But it's certainly straight. This wasn't straight. So I suspected that the behavior here was quadratic. And so I came up with a quadratic regression. That is, given a data, and I want a formula of the form a x squared plus bx minus c, or plus c, find me those a, b's, and c's. And when I threw this into a uh, quadratic regression calculator, right, uh, let's see, let me go ahead and bring this over here. And we'll take a look at it. It came up with this. That's that red line right there. Very, very small constant out front here. 
Why? Well, what's that capturing the notion of? How fast one addition is, which is going to be very, very fast. How many seconds does an addition take? Well, the computers are fast, right? This is going to be very, very fast. It's only going to take 0 0.00064 seconds for each addition. But how many additions are there? There are n squared of them, right? This is a correction term, and then this is a constant term down here. Ultimately, we're, not, we're going to ignore those. There's a correlation coefficient here of 0.994. Right? That almost fits perfectly. Right? So my intuitive notion that this is probably a quadratic uh, behavior was confirmed empirically here. I mean, it fits 0.994. You don't, it doesn't get any better than that. Right? Well, 0.995. Right? One is perfect. Right? Then that's, th that's a perfect curve right there. Right? So it does get better, but not much. Right? So why? What's going on here? It's that same painter that's leaving his paintbrush at the beginning. Each time you get the ith element, what do you have to do? You have to start at the beginning of the fence and traverse to the ith index. Start over. Traverse to the ith plus oneth index. Start over. I plus two, I plus three, I plus three, uh, four, et cetera, et cetera. While this is running, let's try to figure that out mathematically. Right? We've already looked at it from an empirical perspective. Now let's look at it from a theoretical perspective, from a mathematical perspective. Right? Iteration. On the first iteration, we're not doing much. Right? How many uh, node traversals do we do? Traversal. So for the first iteration, we get the head, and we add the head to zero. So we're not doing any node traversals there at all. On the second iteration, what do we have to do? We start at the head and go to the second node, right? So here's the head, and we have to go to the second node to get with a value there to add it to our sum. Okay. So how many node traversals did I do there? One. Okay. On the third iteration, how many node traversals do we have? If I want to go and get the third one, then it's going to be one, two. And you start seeing a pattern emerge here. Predict on the fourth iteration, how many node traversals are you going to need to do? Three, dot, dot, dot. On the ith iteration, how many node traversals are you going to need to do? I minus one, dot, dot, dot. What's the last iteration? N. So how many node traversals are you going to need to do then? n minus 1. Now, add these all up. Sum total. All right. What's it going to be? W well, 0, you can go ahead and ignore that because it doesn't add anything to it. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus dot 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 plus, and then the last one was n minus 1. All right. Does anybody know what this is? No? Oh, the sum of natural numbers, right? There's this uh, guy named Gauss, who uh, the apocryphal story is that, uh, apocryphal as in if it's, it's, not pro it's probably not true, uh, he was annoying his professor, or anno annoying his uh, tutor or whatever, and so he said, uh, uh, told Gauss, gave him some busy work to do. Go sum up the numbers 1 through 100. Go off into the corner and do it. Uh, and he immediately comes back with an annoying answer and continues to ignore him, I I annoy him 50-50. Right? In other words, he didn't go through all the work of 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, dot, dot, dot. What did he do? He came up with a general formula. The sum of i running from 1 up to n, right, that's equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n, that is equal to, does anybody know it off the top of their head? n times n plus 1 all over 2. All right. So because his prof or tutor, who, professor, whoever it was, said sum up the numbers 1 to 100, all he did was plug in 100 and 100, right? uh, plus 1, divide by 2 means that this is 50. 101 times 50 is 50-50. Right. That's how he came up with it. Let's use that over here. This is equal to, now we're not going all the way up to n. 
we're stopping short. So it could be this minus n, or what you could do is you could take n minus one and plug it in here, and take n minus one and plug it in here, and minus one plus one becomes n, and therefore it's what? n times n minus one all over two. Okay, that's just algebra. I, I'm speeding through the algebra because I assume that we can all get it. Right. Okay, let's expand that out. N minus, N, or sorry, N times N minus one all over two is going to be one half N squared uh, minus one half N. Okay, in other words, A quadratic, there is a C here, that C is zero, and so we'll ignore it. That's the number of operations of node traversals that you could expect to uh, execute when you're doing this for uh, a list of size n. Okay. What is what? What's the most important term here? This this square term right here, right? So, you know. For all intents and purposes, let's just go ahead and ignore this down here. Right? In fact, since this is minus, we've made this bigger right? because we've, we're ignoring it. Now, what about that one half right there? Does that matter? Again, what is that capturing? That's capturing how much, uh, how many oper uh, how how much, how many seconds each operation takes on your computer. Take this program that I'm running right now and move it over to your computer. Would this number change? Yeah. Yours is faster than mine, this number will go down. Yours is slower than mine, it will go up. Right? But does this term right here change, this n squared? Nope. So let's just go ahead and ignore it. And this is about n squared. Ignoring lower order terms, ignoring constants, gives us the most important information about this. And eventually, we're going to call this big O of n squared. Right. Big O is a uh, Omicron, uh, Greek letter Omicron, but it's, it's indistinguishable from O, so we just say O. Right. It's order n squared. Right. Is it done? Nope. Instead, now that we've got both theoretical and empirical evidence showing that this is indeed the behavior, let's go ahead and uh, think about it for, say, 10 million. If I were to, uh, what, did I, what am I running this on, by the way? I'm running this on 1 million. Let's go ahead and stop it. What if I were to run this on 10 million based on this equation right here? Well, here, let's uh, ask Wolfram Alpha to do our homework here. There we go. For n being 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, there's 1 million. There we go. And can I label this as seconds? Uh, you're not going to be that smart, are you? Nope. What if I put this in front? Can I do that? Ah, come on, really? All right, so I'll take off seconds here. And let's just get this raw number. Uh, oh, okay, it's not going to let me do that either. This is turning out to be more work than it was worth. All right, give me that number. There we go. Seconds. There we go. One thousand, a hundred, one, uh, uh, I put 10 million, right? Uh, okay, so that's 10 million. Uh, there we go. There, 20 years, right, for 10 million. Is that right? What did I put in there? That's not right. One million. Anyway, uh, I must have copied it down wrong. I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, uh, my, uh, my original calculation were, if I have 10 million elements, this is going to be about seven, 18 hours. Right. If you kick this up to 100 million, it's going to be, uh, what is it, 74 days. In other words, we're going about by orders of magnitude of time intervals here. We're going from hours to days to, and then what if it was 1 billion? 20 years. Right. There it is, years, years, there we go. Right. 
versus, let's come back over here and stop it because it's not going to be done, right? Uh, let's go ahead and kick this down to, uh, well, one million, one, two, three, 10 million, but let me use an array-based list instead. There we go. Done. That was, uh, what was that? 10 million? 100 million. It's gonna be noticeable, especially when we're loading and creating all these numbers. Uh, but the actual calculations are not gonna be 74 days. It's going to be 0.21 seconds. Let's go up to a billion and it probably won't execute. We're, we're gonna run out of memory here. Right? But if this were to execute and I had enough memory, guess what? Not 20 years. It's gonna be like maybe a minute or so. Right? So here were my estimates from whenever I ran this. That's going to be linear behavior. Yeah, we're, there, we ran out of money. Oh, we ran out of money. Uh, we ran out of uh, same, difference. same difference, exactly, right? How much is RAM going for now? 64, 64 gig dim would be what? Or 64 gig dim would be what? 120? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, orders of magnitude quicker, say two minutes instead of 20 years. In other words, these things matter. Algorithms, algorithm analysis, knowing when to use a proper data structure and in a proper way matters. In case you think that this is indeed a trumped up example here that was just uh, made just to demonstrate the, the difference between these two things, it is not. This was grabbed from a system that somebody sa said, hey, wait, hey, there's this open source software project that's that has great code that people should be using and stuff like that and you know and we should be using it i opened up the very first thing that i opened up had this loop in there and i knew right away that this was garbage code right you do not do this with blind lists all right instead what do you do in java int x in the collection list you don't get the ith element, you simply get x. Now guess what? That linked list implementation that took so long for 10 million elements here, 0.1 seconds, right? So I, I, I knew right away not to trust anything this guy told me uh, about this uh, open source software uh, uh, system. Uh, the, the very second that I saw that they weren't using an enhanced for loop, right? All right, I knew it was garbage. Okay, and it, and it bared out to, they were using weird patterns everywhere. Uh, instead of using builder patterns, they were using, uh, they, they had one, uh, they had custom uh, exceptions and they wanted them to be so flexible that the, these exceptions, uh, they had one constructor that took 16 arguments and depending on how you wanted to use it, you had to set certain, uh, like a subset of those arguments to a null. And so everywhere you saw this throw exception and then random nulls everywhere and random values everywhere. It was completely unreadable, right? So I, I, that I will not name the system, <laughs> but it was terrible. Right? Should be clear that programs require like, like money, <laughs> like you said. Uh, algorithms require some sort of computational resource. For example, actual time, CPU time. Those are not necessarily the same. Clock time versus actual time is different because your, your program can be swapped out for other programs, right? Uh, obviously, the thing that we just ran out of trying to do this experiment, memory, right? But what else can a computer, running a computer cost you? Actual money, right? Right? But what else? Bandwidth. What? Say it. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. So you're, you're, you're thinking in terms of network. Bandwidth or throughput. The difference there being the bandwidth is how much, you know, how many lanes you have. The throughput is how much can you shove through those lanes, right? How much data can you actually get through the network? Right? Those are your modern bottlenecks. Those are still going to be the slowest things in, in computational processes, which is why you don't want to send a lot of data over the network, which is why connection pooling. Somebody asked about connection pooling. I'll, uh, 
I don't know if I have any other resources on uh, Piazza, but uh, I'll certainly look for some, right? All right, so bandwidth throughput, what else? I'm at 100%, I'm at 75%, and I'm at 80%. Battery or power consumption, right? This is why it was worth it to do Bitcoin mining when electricity was cheap, or you could use somebody else's electricity. Right? But now that electricity is more expensive than the actual Bitcoin mining pays, right, then we see a precipitous decline in uh, people hoarding their uh, 1080, uh, no, 3080 cards now, right? right? So now you can actually get a 3080 card now, right? Or 4080 is probably what they're on, okay, right? They don't, uh, yeah, they don't what? Yeah, the, the, because the, the, the computational re resources also increase as you mine more and more, as, as everybody mines more and more. And that was built into the system, right? Uh, basically preventing inflation, right? Uh, with respect to the Bitcoin ecosystem, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, but power, power consumption, definitely. Right? What else? So if you were actually designing a circuit, you probably haven't gotten there yet. I don't know, is anybody taking 230 or 231 right now? Usually it's in your second, third semester or so, where you start looking at processors, uh, memory hierarchy, et cetera, right? So circuitry, right? The number of wires or gates, right? the size of a circuit is also a computational resource. Um, if you can get an equivalent circuit with say, three fewer gates or three fewer wires, you do that. Why? Because the more number of wires and the more number of gates means directly more power. It means less time or uh, more time to, uh, to actually compute because electricity doesn't flow at the speed of light. Right? There's an impedance there. Right? Uh, also, printing it onto a die, if you can get them smaller and smaller and smaller, you can print more onto a die and, uh, and improve uh, your, your actual output. One that you probably have never thought about is idleness. So it's always a joke. You know, I'll put it in terms of a joke. Uh, suppose that you bought that $5,000 PC, that 4080Ti uh, card, uh, and then you use it to play Minecraft all day. <laughs> good, good use of resources? Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, if you want all the bells and missiles, yes, fine. But you probably didn't need to spend $5,000 on a machine. Okay, I'll, uh, let's not go with Minecraft. Let's go with, I don't know, Candy Crush or some 2D game or something like that, right? You probably don't need all that. Another example would be spending $20,000 on a really beefy server to serve a web page for five users, right? Why? When you can use modern containerization and virtualization, where that $15,000, $20,000 server machine now has 50 virtual machines on it, right? And so you can serve the entire campus. Every single department can have a virtual machine that serves their website out of that, right? And you're only spending it on one server instead of 50 different servers, right? Idleness or utilization can also be seen as a resource. These are all very, very important when you're talking about engineering. Right? When you've got an engineering question, engineering concern, absolutely you start thinking about these things. And you start thinking about them in terms of trade-offs. Right? For example, if you want to buy a new phone, are you gonna buy a new phone that is twice as fast or that consumes half as much power? Which one do you want? Do you need to run Bitcoin mining on your phone? Probably not a good use. Do you need to run Minecraft on your phone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you want to run it, you want to play for 10 hours instead of five, right? So probably there, your consideration would be power consumption. Uh, every year or so, a Garmin comes in and does a presentation and they had a choice between two sorting algorithms, quick sort, which as the name implies is quick, or bubble sort, which, should be called slow sort. They chose bubble sort. 
slower sorting algorithm. Why? Because it had a smaller memory footprint. And they needed to redo, and their, their design consideration, their engineering consideration at the time was making sure that it was memory efficient. Cache hits and misses were small. And so they, were, uh, they, they went with a slower uh, algorithm knowing that it was better on memory. Those are all important when you're considering engineering concerns. However, what about algorithms? Algorithms predate modern engineering by thousands of years. Euclid's GCD algorithm is over 2,500 years old, something like that. Right? Uh, does that mean that Euclid's GCD algorithm is now suddenly fast 2,500 years in the future? And in the future, it'll be even faster, right? 3,000 years from now when we've all got quantum computing and Star Trek computing, whatever, right? No. It took the same exact number of operations to compute a GCD, GCD greatest common divisor, right? Uh, that you take this value, you divide it by that value. You take the remainder, divide it by that value again. Take the remainder, divide it by that value until you get down to one, right? And whatever the value was previous to that was your uh, greatest common divisor. If it took you five steps on a piece of papyrus 2,500 years ago, it will still take you five steps today on a computer. It will take you five steps 3,000 years from now on those magic computers, right? In other words, the algorithms are invariant. The behavior and efficiency of algorithms is invariant over time, over the type of hardware you use, papyrus versus you know, vacuum tubes versus uh, integrated circuits versus quantum magic right, in the future. Right? From a theoretical perspective, what we need is an abstract notion of what a resource is that's not tied to a particular machine 2,500 years ago or 2,500 years in the future. We want to analyze our algorithms with respect to an abstract general perspective. What matters is the performance as the input size increases, right? When I go from, say, 1,000 integers up to 10,000, up to 100,000, up to a, a million, what, how does the performance degrade? Obviously, it's going to get worse. Right? It's going to take more and more time. But does it grow linearly, right? nice straight curve, or does it grow quadratically, an unacceptable curve? Right? In fact, let's take a, since this is the honors section, and everybody has calculus. Yes, let's look at it from two different perspectives here. All right. Doodles my kids did that I didn't take out yet. All right, so I don't, I don't know what was it. I'm sure that's more than, okay. Nope. I don't know what, what it was. Right. Uh, anyway, it's probably my doodles in response to their doodles. All right. Let's think about that nice linear curve. Again, for for, per, uh, for most purposes, what I'll just say that it, it's n. That our constant sitting out front here is 1, so it disappears. That our constant sitting right here doesn't exist, it's 0. Okay. If I have an input size of n, and I go up to an input size of 10n, I go from 1,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000. And if I think that this takes time t here, then what time is it going to take here if it's linear? 10t. 10t. What if it's quadratic? In other words, it goes from t to, well, yeah, here, I'll, I'll go, it, I go from n to 10n, and it's something like 10n squared because it's linear. Oh, it's, it's quadratic. What's going to happen to that 10 out front? 100. So in other words, it'll be, end up being 100t, right? So orders of magnitude greater with quadratic versus linear. Now, because you all have calculus, let's think of, of it in terms of calculus. What is the rate of growth, or how is the rate of growth measured? The what? The first derivative. So wh what's the second derivative? That's the rate of growth of the rate of growth, right? Third derivative is the rate of growth of the rate of growth of the rate of growth, right? So what's the first derivative of n? Oops. Constant, one, right? 
n squared. What's the first derivative of n squared? 2n. Constant versus linear. You already know what the growth rates are. One stays flat. One goes up. Right? In other words, no growth rate at all versus a linear growth rate. Right? And by the way, just for a preview here, what if you had a really terrible, terrible algorithm? Something that was exponential. What's the first derivative of an exponential? All right, change of base. You need to change the base so that because you have e to the x, what's the first derivative of e to the x? e to the x. And now you know why we call this the natural log. It's not natural as in 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's what's natural to humans. What's natural to mathematicians? Not that mathematicians aren't human, but they're a different type of human, right? So what's the, what's the difference? It, e is the value for which this coefficient becomes 1. Because if it's any other base, what do you have? The natural log of 2, 2 to the n. Right? It doesn't disappear, this, uh, this coefficient out front here. It disappears w when you have a natural base of e. 2.71, what's natural about that? Right? The only thing that's natural about it is that the, uh, the coefficient goes away on the first derivative. Right? Same reason why, w why pi is 3.14, or wh why, are, why, why are there two radians in a circle? Why is it 2 pi instead of, why, didn't, why isn't that r pi right there? It's one radian is equal to 1 pi. Right? Why? because you plug it into a bunch of formulas and a bunch of constants go away and it makes it nicer to write. Right? That's the only reason. Right? Okay, all right, that was our mathematical digression. All right, algorithms are going to be independent of the hardware that we're gonna run them on, okay? They predate modern computers by thousands of years. They don't suddenly become efficient because we've got efficient hardware they don't become magically faster because you upgrade to a, to a 4080 Ti, right? Uh, individual operations do become faster, but oh, and you can compute larger and larger input sizes, but the number of operations remains the same. The rate of growth of an algorithm determined, uh, remains invariant across all hardware. That first derivative does not change. If it's a linear function, the first derivative stays a constant. If it's a quadratic function, the first derivative stays a linear function. Larger input sizes lead to slower performance equals more resources. That's the idea that we want to capture. Okay. So consequently, we are going to ignore those lower order terms like we did here. Right? There are lower, lower order terms sitting out in front of all this stuff. There's lower order terms right here in my quadratic regression. I don't want to have to worry about those details. I want to have to worry about algorithms in general. And to do that, we introduce a notion of pseudocode. So do they offer Latin here at all? They do, okay. So you, the, you folks taking Latin, tell me what pseudo is. Fake, right? Fake code, pseudocode. Uh, pseudoephedrine, fake ephedrine apparently, right? Uh, it is fake code. An algorithm is an unambiguous sequence of instructions for solving a problem. If you were to open up Webster's Dictionary, you would get a dictionary, a dictionary definition, something like that. That's not math. That's not a mathematical definition, right? This is not a mathematical definition. For that, see Turing machines or Lambda calculus, which is not the calculus that you're familiar with, like first derivative, second derivative stuff. It's just a general term for calculations, lambda calculus, or Turing machines, due to Turing, right? Uh, uh, Alan Turing. And the Church Turing thesis is that those are the mathematical definitions of what an algorithm is, right? That goes beyond the scope of this course. For us, this nice little dictionary definition is gonna be enough. And that's where we introduce good pseudocode. It's going to be an unambiguous sequence of instructions for solving a problem. Good pseudocode makes use of plain English when appropriate. Right. Uh, makes use of plain mathematical notation, good mathematical notation. Right. 
doesn't use any language specific constructs. So for example, we're not going to put a semicolon at the end of every line. Uh, we're not going to use opening and closing curly brackets. We're not going to do anything that will force us into any particular language. Right? It provides necessary details without too many unnecessary details. If that seems kind of weaselly, it is. It's called the Goldilocks zone. All right? The Goldilocks zone uh, in, in, uh, in, in astronomy, the Earth is in the Goldilocks zone, right? If we go several hundred million miles out, then it becomes too cold for liquid water. If we go several hundred million miles in, then it becomes too hot for liquid water, right? And it'll all burn off for an atmosphere. So we're right in the Goldilocks zone, right? The good zone where we can actually have a habitable planet. It comes from Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I'm about out of power. I said I was at 70%, now I'm at like 30. There we go. OBS takes a lot. Right. So you're upgrading to OBS. <laughs> go fa go, uh, I'm at 60 frames per second, by the way. I probably don't need to be at 60 frames per second. Uh, I could probably kick that down. Uh, anyway, uh, the Goldilocks story, right? Goldilocks and the three bears, she breaks into their home. She tries the first porridge and it's too hot. She tries the second porridge. Oh, it's too cold. She tries the third porridge. That's just right. right. So, pseudocode. What should it look like? It shouldn't be too terse. It shouldn't be too verse. It should uh, uh, verbose. It should be just right. Can I give you a rule that says that's right, that's wrong? No. Then it wouldn't be pseudocode. It would be code. If I gave you a bunch of rules for writing pseudocode, what do you think Java is? It's a bunch of rules for writing code. What do you think Python is? It's a bunch of rules, syntactical rules for writing code. If I gave you rules on how pseudocode should look, you got yet another programming language. I'll give you guidelines and I'll show you examples of what I think looks like good pseudocode, <laughs> which turns out to be actual code because they're all taken from LaTeX. Right? So let's take a look at an example. Uh, our old friends say linear search, right? Oops, there we go, uh, sticker. Linear search, linear search. So what does linear search look like? Given a collection and a key, K, find if some A in A matches You're searching for a needle in the haystack. That's the problem statement. That's not the algorithm. Let's write some pseudocode that represents the algorithm to solve this problem. Pseudocode clearly labels the input. My input will be a collection, and I'll give it a label, A, A1, A2, dot, 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 AN, of elements, and a key, K. Now observe what I did with this. First of all, did I write it in parentheses because they are function parameters? No, that would be a language. Did I say that this was a set, a list, an array, a map? Nope, I kept it general and generic. Did I say that these were integers or strings or doubles? No, it's kind of like polymorphism on steroids. Right, because now we're not even talking about any actual particular language. Now we are talking about more general, like as generic and general as possible. The goal of good pseudocode should be that you could take that pseudocode and translate it to any language that you want. Right? Of elements and a key K. And my output here is going to be an element A in A. And good mathematical notation, since you all have 235 already, or are in it. There's my set notation. We've seen it before now. Yes, by now? Okay. An element A such that A is equal to K. And what happens, I mean, we, we might not find our needle in the haystack, right? So what could be our placeholder here for an unsuccessful search? 
throwing an exception, not all languages support exceptions. False, that sounds like, uh, like false all lowercase, that sounds like Java. Uh, capital F, false, sounds like Python. Zero sounds like C. All right, let's use some mathematical notation. C as our placeholder, all right? If no such element. Did I specify the first element, all elements, the last element, the third element that I found? Nope, it's just an element, okay? For each A in A, did I write a traditional for loop like I did over here? Uh, I've gotten rid of it, let's undo, undo, undo. There we go. Where I create an index variable, initialize it to zero, the idiomatic for loop, i is less than uh, n, i plus plus. Nope, I said for each. Right? There, is no uh, there is a language that has the for each keyword, no space, PHP, which we did not cover this semester in, in favor of Python. Uh, oops, I, I was thinking too much Python in the back of my head, why? This little colon right here, let's get rid of that now. Nope, it's not Python, as much as you want it to be Python. For each A in A, if A matches the key, then output A. Did I say return system.out.println? Print? Nope. None of that stuff. If I get through the entire thing and I don't find it, then I'll output B as my placeholder there. I'm not going to strictly use indentation. That would be Python. I'm not going to use opening cl cl closing curly brackets here because that would be C style syntax to denote code blocks. Instead, I'm gonna do something that you cannot do with any programming language that I know of. I will have these vertical lines indicating that this block begins here and ends there. And I'll also label the lines, one, two, three, four. You actually do see this in the wild. Right? You see it right here. My main begins right here. And once I hover over that thing right there, I see a vertical line going all the way to the end of the block. I could, cause I can collapse it, all right? And expand it back out. And if you look real close, there's this indentation line down at the bottom indicating that that's where it ends. Right? The reason I use this style for Python, uh, for a uh, pseudocode is because that's what the algorithm 2E environment does in Python. Uh, and I've, I've, I've configured it over the years to make sure that I'm not using any language specific things. Right? For example, one equal sign, most programming languages, that is a assignment operator. This is math, right? That's not the assignment operator, equals equals, or in other programming languages where you don't have strict typing, equals 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 equals, right? PHP, Java, Python? No, I don't think so. Right. Uh, but in any case, I'm using, I'm intentionally using things that have no language equivalent in the most uh, most programming languages that I know of. You cannot write this on the QWERTY keyboard. Right. In fact, the reason that most programming languages are the way that they are is because of the QWERTY keyboard. The QWERTY keyboard predating modern computers by a hundred years or something like that, right? and so they they made do with what was on the keyboard already, right? Uh, if they wanted to expand it out for all these mathematical things, right, you'd have a pretty damn big keyboard. In fact, there are keyboards like that. Uh, Japanese keyboards in the 70s and 80s. The Japanese alphabet is, I think, 48 hiragana, 48 katakana, and then, of course, thousands of uh, uh, kanji. And they had these big, giant keyboards where all of them were there. Right? Imagine typing on that. Uh, it didn't work. Right? Then they adopted the QWERTY keyboard. I don't think those exist anymore. I, you could probably find a Google image search of them or something. Right? But in any case, this is our good pseudocode. Okay. As a really quick preview here, of the, there are going to be five-step process. I'll tell you what the first four steps are of algorithm analysis. Is that you identify the input, you identify the input size, you identify the elementary operation, and then you determine how many times the elementary operation is, ex is ex executed with respect to the input size. Step five is big O analysis, which we'll save for later.
What about those first two steps? Here, I'll do it in blue. One, what's the input? If you wrote good pseudocode, it's done for you already. Now, be careful. What's the input? It's a collection and a key. Keep things simple. Right? Which one of those should I focus on? What's your intuition tell you? The collection, why? Because it has multiple pieces. This one is only one thing. So let's focus on that. It's the collection A, the collection. Right. Two, what's the input size? Guess what? I encoded it as part of the input. N, the number of elements in there. I didn't start at one, zero, oh, zero did I? Because that's a programming language thing. Not all programming languages begin uh, use uh, zero indexing. Does anybody have any R experience? R, it's a statistical language. All right, w what is their indexing? One. All right, what about MATLAB? Anybody? Nope. One. All right. Uh, I think that there's a third one, but I forget what it is. Right. Not everybody does the same th those things the same way. Right. Why? Why does R do it? By the way, <laughs> because it, it's a programming language for people who don't program. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to be cooler or something. Okay, I'll buy that. Right. What's the elementary operation here? So I'm doing a lot of stuff, right? I'm doing a for loop. That probably involves a traditional idiomatic for loop of an initialization, a comparison to see if you're done with a loop, an addition to add one to the index. Okay. There's a comparison right here. There's an output, and then there's another output. Why might I not want to focus on the, those outputs? Because that's the end of the algorithm. It only happens once. It does not depend on the input size up here. This for loop depends on the input size, but you're doing something inside of that loop. You generally ignore the loop control con constructs because whatever you're doing inside of that loop is way more important than the loop itself. So yes, at the end of the day, you might have an initialization, a comparison, and an addition, like with a tr uh, with a idiomatic for loop. But who cares? This is more important. Whatever you're doing inside that loop is probably way more important. Right? That leaves this one line right here, right? and the comparison on line two. That's why I like to label the lines because you can make direct reference to it. Four, you tell me, how many times does the elementary operation execute with respect to the input size? What's your intuition tell you? What's your intuition tell you? N times, about N times. Now, be careful. If two minutes sit here, you could get lucky. You found the needle immediately without searching everything. So what's the minimum number of comparisons that you would make? One. What's the maximum number of comparisons that you would make? You get unlucky. And maybe we have an argument for looking at something in between. What's the average? Well, naively, it's just going to be this, which is equal to 1 half n. Graph this and graph this. Guess what? They're both linear functions. Right? It doesn't matter that the coefficient out front is one half. We're ultimately going to ignore that. Is there a difference between these two things? No. It's just the slope. Is it slightly steeper, a little bit steeper or not? What does the first derivative of this tell you? n divided by 2. What's the first derivative of that? It's still constant. Yes, it's one half instead of one. The derivative of this is going to be 1, but these are both constant. They have the same rate of growth from a mathematical perspective. So might as well just consider the max. In fact, that's what we'll do. All right, more on Wednesday.